Well, we finish up the book of Romans uh, today, and we're going to do it in a little bit of a different way. I wanted to uh, share the stage with Shirley this weekend because the passage we're going to deal with has uh, to do with women, the importance and role of women in Scripture. She had to be in Nashville uh, to be a mother and to be a grandmother, so we taped it ahead of time right here on this stage a few days ago, and that'll be the bulk of our message today. I think it'll bless you women uh, greatly, and I think uh, for you men as you kind of peek in on the honor that Paul gives to women. I hope it will just cause you to, to love and respect and honor women all the more. Uh, but let's just kind of back up a little bit. The Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Romans, understood the power of the gospel to transform a life in every way. Because uh, he wrote this in 1 Timothy about himself. He said, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am the chief, chief of sinners. And yet for this reason, I found mercy in order that in me as the chief of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And that's where you get the phrase, there is no sin that is a match for the grace of God. Because Paul says, I was the chief of sinners, and yet the grace of God was more than abundant to save me. And that transformed Paul's life. And here's the deal with the gospel. The gospel embraced always becomes the gospel embodied. Where there is a true root of salvation, there will be the fruit of salvation. And that usually shows up in our relationships in the world. So when you look at the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, that was his Jewish name, he was an angry man. He was a terrorist. He was a hater. He was a Jewish man ascending the ladder of prominence in Jewish culture. He would probably have, have ended up on the Sanhedrin, the top 70 leaders in Israel. Uh, but he hated, he absolutely hated Gentiles. Gentiles to the Jews were called dogs. You wouldn't even associate with a Gentile. You wouldn't eat with a Gentile. You wouldn't spend time with sinners like tax collectors or immoral people. You would never uh, put your foot on Samaritan soil because the Samaritans were evil. They were darkness. They were without light. Paul hated Christians. Saul, I should say, before his name was changed to Paul, he hated Christians. He became the lead persecutor of the church. He thought the Christians were heretics. He led them off to prison and to death. He was a hater. And one of the things that, that Paul had in his Jewish background is he had very little respect for women. Because in Jewish culture, women couldn't attend uh, the seminary, so to speak. They couldn't become rabbis. They couldn't become teachers. They had a separate place where they sat in the synagogue. They couldn't testify in courts of law. And all of this is part of Paul's worldview, his relationships toward Gentiles, toward Samaritans, uh, toward anybody outside of his realm, toward sinners, toward women. It was his, his social life reflected his spiritual condition as this legalistic, proud, trying to be better than everybody else. And then Christ comes into his life. And once you know, this person who hates Christians becomes the foremost apostle of Christ to the world. This man who hates Gentiles becomes the apostle, not to the Jews, but the apostle to the Gentiles. This man's life was transformed and his view of women was totally overturned. And you miss this sometimes as you read Paul, but Shirley and I wanted to bring that out today. And, and whenever she sees a passage in the New or Old Testament that highlights the the role of women. She's all about it. And she really wanted to participate today just to show you from Romans chapter 16, which is Paul's final greetings. He greets 28 people. But amidst that greeting list, there are some really key women. It surely helped me kind of bring out the details on that. So uh, the bulk of this message will be this video, and then I'll come up at the end and sort of wrap up the book of Romans. But, I, but the big picture of what I want you to see is how the gospel embraced by Paul totally became the gospel embodied by Paul as he learned to love all the kinds of people that he disrespected before, Gentiles 
and, and the Christians and the sinners and the outsiders. In fact, his closest companion was Luke, a Gentile who actually traveled with him throughout the empire and wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Paul's life was changed and his view of women was changed radically. Let's watch. Well, it's great to be able to invite Shirley to share uh, the stage with me to talk about uh, some lessons in one of the most unexpected places in the Bible because it seems like sometimes you get the biggest lessons tucked away in the most hidden places in the Bible. And we find that with uh, Romans chapter 16. Why is this chapter so unique? Well, it's very unique for a section of it because Paul, who obviously, as you've been sharing, had never been to Rome before, but he knew so many people there. And a lot of times it, when we get to lists of people in the Bible or something, it looks very boring and most people just kind of want to skip right over it. But I kind of raised the flag and said, oh, don't, we can't skip over this because out of 28 people that he mentions, 10 of them are women. That's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like what you pointed out back when we went through the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, and there's these four women tucked Absolutely. in there, and you brought that out. So, um, and it's great story. It's important to us as well to cover this for a couple of reasons. One, we want this church to know how much we value women and respect women, but also we want to clarify or clear up some misconceptions that uh, have dogged the Apostle Paul for centuries. Explain kind of what the common view is of Paul about women and how this chapter challenges that. Well, in the New Testament, where he's written some of his letters, I know some of it shows up in 1 Corinthians in particular, mm -hmm. but he definitely can come across as a male chauvinist and um, people think that he doesn't like women, he puts women down, that he makes them look like second-class citizens, those kinds of things. And yet, when you actually take the time to study his comments about these particular women that he highlights in his greetings, it's amazing. I mean, it's actually the opposite of what you would think. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that this can do is kind of vindicate Paul and help others see, wow, I guess he actually did appreciate women, so. Hmm. And it's so interesting, this is in Paul, because Luke's gospel, which was written by Luke, the companion of Paul, is the only gospel that has a list of female disciples in Luke chapter eight. And so it's almost like Luke and Paul were working together to try to say there are key women that contributed to the mission of Jesus and to the mission of the early church. And that's just, uh, it's great stuff. It's exciting. And I'm thankful that we're just making it a focus. Yep. And so out of the 10 women, we knew we couldn't do all 10. Mm -hmm. And not all 10 even have a ton to say about them. Some of the ones, the six other ones, uh, some of them say that they just worked very hard in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, that in and of itself was a compliment. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that even shows up with the first woman that we picked, which is Phoebe, mm -hmm. she's the very first person that is in the list of greetings. Mm -hmm. And the reason that Paul put her first is because she was known to be the one who actually brought the letter from the Corinthian area, Centria, where she was from and where he was, and took the letter quite a long distance to the church in Rome. She was the male woman in the first century, taking the most important document Paul ever wrote. The letter, the letter carrier. Yeah, the letter carrier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She, she was the one who took the letter. And we don't, you know, we don't know a ton about her, but in the first two verses, we learn enough that can really give us some inspiration. Yeah, so give, and us, so, give us some of the key Yeah, some of the things that I think are key is that, first of all, she was single. And, you know, a lot of times, if you're a single woman, that can be hard, mm -hmm. you know, especially in certain cultures where being single is looked down on. But in her case, she was elevated mm -hmm. being single because she used her singleness, which goes back to Paul's difficult letter of 1 Corinthians, right. where he literally says, if you're single, stay single. If you're it's married, stay advantage. married. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's an advantage. Yeah. And I think most people would be like, no, thank you. I'd rather be married, you know. Mm. But in her case, for whatever reason, she was single. And so 
from that, she did what Paul said, and she was able to devote herself more to the things of the Lord. Mm. And it seems like when Paul came to Corinth, she probably became a convert at that point. Mm -hmm. And she ended up in maybe what was a church plant, maybe about seven miles outside of Corinth, in over Centria. Yeah. in Centria, which was a port mm -hmm. right on the Aegean Sea. And um, she was probably the one who hosted a house church there. There's a couple key words that in Greek define her as a very significant uh, player in that church in Centria. She's called a servant, um, but it's actually the translation of the Greek word deaconess. Mm -hmm. So she's called a deaconess, and there are qualifications for deacons and deaconesses in First Timothy. So apparently she had a, an official role in the church. She had a servant leadership reputation mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, she really was someone who just kind of gave herself, who, you know, her time, her talent, and her treasure. Mm -hmm. And as a deaconess, she was a servant. Mm -hmm. And um, that was not something to be a lowly consideration. It was mm -hmm. someone who was actually of high esteem. We don't have deaconesses at Oak Point or deacons, as do some churches, but we have a slew of servant leaders of women. And you know what, that's, women. That's, that's a funny point because early on, we knew we would have elders and we actually started to move toward having deacons and deaconesses. But then when we realized how many people in our church would qualify. It would just. There, there would be so many hundreds. Tons. That we decided, <laughs> we yeah. just decided to call them servants yeah. instead of like deacons and deaconesses. Cause right. every, we, we have literally thousands of people who serve in different ways. That's true. There's the, another, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I was gonna say that the, the other way that really stood out to me was she was called, um, I don't know the word in Greek, but a page, she was like a patron or, or a benefactor, bene benefactor. Mm -hmm. um, which, which is an interesting term because it denotes the idea that she had wealth and she had wealth either from her job as a single woman or she had wealth possibly from inheritance. And she used that for Paul and for the ministry, mm. which is super cool. Mm. I can relate to that, mm. um, having had my father die when I was young and um, having been left with an inheritance mm. that I have been able to be a benefactor. To leverage to, lots of yeah. ministries and be the backbone of. Right, and yeah. just serve and, and yeah. see it as being a servant mm -hmm. um, with that. And I think one one reading I read about this is that really they don't, they don't like to talk about it too much. Like Paul hasn't really made a big emphasis about people who had, quote, resources because really they, he just wanted people to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. And if God's blessed you, then that's just a way that you serve in that capacity, possibly with finances. But that's, that's such an interesting point because again, the, Luke in, uh, the list in Luke 8 of the women, it specifically says one of, one of the women in Herod's household was there, yes, and but it she says they were contributing contrib to the Lord's ministry out of their finances. Right. So they're benefactors as well. Exactly. Lydia in Acts 16, yeah, totally. the seller of purple fabrics, hosted the church. She right. was a businesswoman. She was another benefactor. So it's it's women who, they're not just trustworthy, faithful, available, but but they're strong women like Phoebe who end up playing a, a key role in lots of different ways in the early church. It's, well, and the one last thing I want to say that Paul really, he really wanted her to be seen as someone worthy of honor. And of course, I don't think she would ever toot her own horn, right. but he said, she is my sister in Christ. She, in, he didn't say in Christ, but that's what he meant. My sister. He's yeah. my sister and she's coming to you and she's your sister. She's like our sister in the Lord. And he was really trying to emphasize this family relationship. Mm -hmm. And in family, we care for each other. Mm -hmm. And so he, he really wanted to present her as somebody that they needed to respect mm -hmm. when she showed up with his letter. And, and who knows, maybe she had some tutelage from Paul about the stuff in the letter and actually had to clear some, explain, explain some things, things yep, to yep, them, yep. you know, that she had a personal experience of being able to talk to him There's about. So, so much just in this one woman. I know. That we it, can't keep it talking could be about a whole her. message, but it overturns <laughs> so many ideas about Paul and women. Yeah. In the first century, Christians 
we're actually elevating the importance and role of women. Absolutely. No, another example is And this, she's this. pretty brave, too. To I don't know who traveled with her, but that's a long way. Yeah. And who knows? She could have been a businesswoman, and that could be of something how she got there, or it could have just yeah. been her mission that she was just to take that letter. Let's talk about the next woman who's actually part of the power couple in yes. the New Testament, Priscilla and Aquila. What's Sorry. cool about them, um, she's also called Prisca uh, or Priscilla, is that I think it's only one time maybe that her husband's name is first, Aquila and Priscilla. And all the other times um, she's mentioned that it's Priscilla and then Aquila. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking, I just really appreciate how she obviously had a lot of spiritual gifts. She had a lot of knowledge and wisdom and um, they started lots of house churches, so she was very hospitable. She probably had a lot of gifts. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm sure Aquila did too, but she's always first and she's known to be this woman who was probably more educated and possibly mm -hmm. more knowledgeable in the scriptures than he was. Yeah. It's interesting because when they first appear in Corinth, in uh, the book of Acts, they meet Paul, Acts 18, and Aquila is a tent maker by trade, so is Paul. So they hook up on that basis. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that he was kind of the worker, you know, the tent maker. But well, she was too, it says. They she, both were tent makers. They were tent makers. both tent makers, yeah. okay. And then, but then they, they're mentoring young men like Apollos mm -hmm. in Ephesus. They're starting house churches. Every city they go, it seems like, whether they're in Ephesus or Corinth or Rome, it seems like they're always starting house churches. Just, they're such a powerful, uh, influential couple. Um, true, they were true co-workers with Paul. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, again, that is hard for, for couples, I think, is when they can't have children. And we don't know why they don't have children, but there's never any children mentioned. And what that does is it gives the opportunity for people like them to be freed up, to be more mobile, mm -hmm. more available. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians again, that when you're married, you have to be thinking of things about the world, you know, and having kids and taking them to, he didn't say this, but soccer games or music lessons or, you know, whatever. I mean, your life is a lot fuller when you have children. And so here they are as a couple and they were able to just bring Paul under their wing and love on him and have him in Corinth with them for 18 months. Mm -hmm. And then when he said, I got to go to Ephesus, they're like, okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. And I think also one of the things about them is they were not afraid of the persecution. And obviously Paul had a lot of it as we read in the book of Acts. And one of the things that he says in greeting them, because now they must have been back in Rome at mm -hmm. the point he wrote this letter, um, he said they risk they, for my life, they risked their necks or hmm. it, they risked their lives. Hmm. And so they really did 100% commit themselves to the mission. And hmm. it, it was very inspiring to see all that they mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. in all the different places and four different, four different, God, four different places in the Bible, yeah. in the New Testament. Paul, we got yeah. Acts, Romans, First. Corinthians and 2 Timothy that Priscilla yeah. and Aquila are mentioned. Yeah, they show up everywhere. Yep. Um, just as a backbone. And, they, and they're, they're recognized throughout the, the Roman Empire. They're known. But I like how you say, well, this could be our last little emphasis here. She didn't waste, Priscilla didn't waste her opportunity. She didn't see her station in life uh, not having children, biological children as um, a loss of opportunities so much as an opportunity to to bear fruit and to have spiritual children Absolutely. everywhere. One of the things that Paul commends them for is just wanting to say thank you and the whole, the whole realm of the Roman Empire where the churches are everywhere, they all are thankful for Priscilla and Aquila. Mm -hmm. And that just shows you the wide, broad reach mm -hmm. of their influence and of their love. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Now this next one is really interesting uh, and, and exciting. Um, her name is Junia. In some of your translations, it will read uh, Junius. 
and will somehow use Greek to turn this woman into a man, a male form of the word junia. But um, scholars, uh, early Christian commentators, all the earliest manuscripts uh, tell us that this actually, this woman here, junia, is in fact a woman. And uh, the reason it's, it's so controversial is because of how she is described here. So let's, let's talk about junia. What stands out to you about this woman? Well, the first thing we have to try and figure out, well, we'll never figure it out till we get to heaven, I guess, but Andronicus and Junia are always together. And so, you know, kind of like Priscilla and Aquila, we don't know if Andronicus was her husband or just a fellow brother in Christ that happens to be always linked with her. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's actually so interesting about her um, that goes along very similarly with Priscilla and Aquila is they ended up in prison with Paul. <laughs> so, I mean, they literally also were not afraid of suffering. They were not afraid of um, just being bold about their witness in the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the things that I know you're getting at is that she was called one of the apostles, like g great among the apostles. Yep, Adronicus and Junia who are outstanding among the apostles. So that, you know, that can be understood different ways. They are, they are apostles in the non-official sense of, of messengers, or they're outstanding in the eyes of the apostles, but whatever it means, she's being put up there with this word apostle in the highest ranks of the early church as somebody mm -hmm. who's outstanding. Among the apostles. Among the apostles. Right. That's right. And I've always thought of the word, um, obviously Paul was an apostle, the 12 disciples, well, not obviously Judas, but they were apostles. I mean, he uses that term. In a technical. In a technical like a way role. and then a loose way. Yeah, the but loose I've always, role, is, it's a verb. Apostello just means one sent out. So yeah, it's a so common I've, Greek term exactly. meaning anybody who's a messenger was an apostle. A sent one. Right. And I've always thought of apostle as a sent one. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, too, using that term has, has been historically thought of as being one who has actually seen Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, the question came, they're his kin, so it's, they're, they're probably Jews. Jewish. And um, the they were question... They in Christ before Paul. They were in Christ before Paul, and right. maybe they did see Jesus. Right. Maybe they did, they and maybe that's why that. she could have been in that category mm -hmm. of apostle in that sense. Yeah, yeah, because that was one of the, the qualifications early on for leadership um, was you actually had seen Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's, she is ranked really, really high. She, she went to prison. She was, she was uh, willing to just risk everything to serve Christ. It's, right. A powerful, Junia, another powerful Junia, who woman. would think, yeah, you know? Who, who a little think? name you'd never think to <laughs> m know much about. Right. And unfortunately, we got one verse in the whole Bible yeah. that tells us about Junia, so that's about it. But I, that's I, still I, pretty I, good. I read one funny <laughs> comment, I think you read it too, from a, a commentator, a female commentator on Junia, and she was talking about how um, men have tried to change Junia into a man, you know, with the, the Greek. Yeah, she didn't like that. She said, Good try, man. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the history, the early commentators, the uh, Greek manuscripts, none of them. It was support. kind of a popular girl, female name, actually, back yeah, in her yep. day. So right. it was a little bit yep. hard to make it into a man. All right. One, okay. One last La woman. One last woman. And this is a lot of fun. Well, there's by the way. one uh, of ten last women. We're only one, doing one, four. We're only doing four. Yeah. Um, a mom unnamed. That's really interesting that she wasn't named because every other person in her family got to be named. In who the who New was Testament. the family? Tell us about the family. Well, okay, so this mother was a wife, and her husband happened to be Simon of Cyrene, who, back when Jesus was being beaten and taken down the road to the cr where the cross would be, and he was carrying the cross, he was so weak and so so just about falling over. And here's Simon who comes in for the Passover and he just gets grabbed and said, you know, you take the cross, you carry his cross for him. Well, this Simon is the wife of this woman. 
Mm -hmm. And it says um, in, the, in Mark's gospel, which is kind of interesting because Mark, the gospel of Mark was really taken from all of the sermons of Peter. Preached in Rome. Preached in yeah, Rome, which right. is where Paul's writing to. Yeah, yeah. and Mark so mentions the two sons. He, meant, he mentions the two sons, Rufus and, and Alexander. Alexander, right. and he mentions it in parentheses in the gospel as if everybody in Rome knows who they are. Exactly, and so now you come to the letter yep. and you've got Paul saying, can greet Rufus. So first he greets the son, okay? And then he says, and greet his mother. And we find this in verse 13, but in chapter 16. More than his mother, says his, his mother. Say, yes, his mother who raised him and this, the other brother. So as a mother, she did that job, but she was also a mother to me. Yeah, his mother and mine. He his says. mother and mine. And yet they weren't biologically related. So no. how is this woman, this unnamed woman, who's the wife of Simon who carried the cross. He must have become a Christian and led his family to Jesus somehow. She's the mother of these two kind sons. of famous sons. Who Alexander might have been actually Rufus. younger at the point of the cross. How you know. did she serve as a mother to Paul? Well, the big question to me is <laughs> um, Paul says at the beginning of the book of Romans, he's never been to Rome yet. Yeah, he hadn't been right? to Rome. So he's greeting someone who's been a mother to him in a place that he's never been yet. So that begs the question, where were they living where she was able to nurture and care as a mom for him? It certainly wasn't Rome, but they, they made from, their way to Rome Well, somehow. they were from Simon of Cyrene. So they were from Cyrene, Cyrene. so they must have been Jewish people who moved around the empire. But in some way, this woman used her touch Yes. To get, what would it be like to be a mother to Paul? You don't think of Paul as like needing a mother. Well, you never hear about his own personal family either. I know, but you think of him as such a tough guy, you know, he can endure all this suffering, but here he's in this tender moment, he says, greet Rufus and his mother and mine. And That's like yes. a tender. And I, again, it's showing Paul in a different light. Mm -hmm. It's showing the vulnerability of him to say, hey, I was nurtured by this older woman, and mm -hmm. she was like a mom to me. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that just shows his love for women and yeah. how women can minister to even special people like Paul. Yeah, so, so valuable. Um, there's, there's others in this chapter. It's a, a fun little combo of these two girls named... Uh, Trifon Trifena and Trifosa. Yeah, Trifosa. <laughs> yeah, and in Greek, uh, in Roman times, if you had twins, you would make their names rhyme a lot. So Trifena and Trifosa were two girls who apparently were twin sisters. It's so interesting. Their names mean dainty and delicate, and yet Paul describes them as hard workers in the gospel. <laughs> Just little nuggets like these dainty and delicate grew up to be roll up their sleeves, hard workers in the work of the gospel for Paul. So many little nuggets here where I think Paul's just trying to say, all these women were huge uh, contributors and backbones and encouragers and fellow sufferers and letter carriers and house church right. leaders and right. mentors. It's, right. It's got to encourage you, right, this whole chapter? Totally. I mean, I even just these four women just sitting in their stories, even if they only have a verse, you know, and just thinking about what would that have been like for them? And um, how does that inspire and challenge me as a mm -hmm. woman? Like what, and I think, you know, obviously our lives are all in chapters. And if you do have little kids, like obviously Rufus and Alexander were kids at some point, mm -hmm. um, that's a responsibility and a ministry for you as a mom. If you're single, obviously you can do a lot. If you're married with no kids, you can, kind of act like a single in some ways. I mean, mm -hmm. you get to do a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it just really begs the question, okay, in my age and stage of life, like what is God asking of me? Like where, mm -hmm. where in my story right now in the chapters I'm living, where do I fit and what should I be faithful in doing? Mm -hmm. And, you know, even for Rufus's mother, who was a mother to Paul, I mean, she got the same kind of a commendation and greeting as maybe another woman who acted in, like she was really a somebody, you know, out there doing a lot more. Yeah. But in Paul's mind, you know, if we're all doing 
what God is calling us to do, whatever that looks like, mm -hmm. it's worthy of saying thank you and mm -hmm. putting these women on display. Well, so they, these women do encourage yep, me a lot, yep. just to follow their example. Yep. Yeah, and I just want to say to the women of Oak <clears throat> Point Church, um, I feel, Shirley and I feel like this about you. This Absolutely. church has so many been women. built on the backbone of a women's wisdom and passion and contributions in every area of the church. And if we were writing a letter. Gifted teachers, we'd, leaders. We'd have a long list, more than 20, 28 names or however many are here. We'd have right. hundreds of names of people that we would thank that are women. Uh, we want you to know you're valued. We respect you. We value your leadership, your input, your wisdom. Um, and just an encouragement that if you are married and you're not um, necessarily at that st stage of life where your child, ch children take a lot of your time, you know, be like a Priscilla and Aquila, like be, be really active. And um, if, if God's given you the opportunity to be single, you know, it's not a place where you need to be alone. You know, you can h house a life group or do something, mm -hmm. you know, where you really gain a lot of very close relationships with people. And so you don't feel alone. Yep. And last, I would like to say thank you to you Oh, yeah. for being my, in so many ways, all of these things, no. a co-leader, uh, a mother, biologically, spiritually, a teacher, a wisdom giver to me, um, partner in ministry in, in so many of these ways. If I was writing the letter, I would definitely... Put me in there? I'd put you in there. Aw, <laughs> Love you. It. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Hey. Yeah, I really do appreciate having uh, somebody who, early on when I was uh, challenged to read Romans 50 times, my mentor knew I was biblically illiterate, and uh, he said, I need you to be heresy-proofed for life. So he had me read Romans. He quoted Martin Lloyd-Jones, the British preacher, who said, if you master Romans, you get an entire theological education. So Shirley saw me. We were still dating in college and headed toward marriage, and she saw me starting to devour Romans. and. Second Timothy and Ephesians, she decided in that moment she was going to keep up with me for all of life, no matter how many degrees I got or where, where I went, she was gonna be my peer in scripture, my Bible buddy. And uh, that reflects that because she is one of those people, I can talk to her about anything in the Bible and she knows it so deeply. Um, and she really just wanted uh, the women of the church to again see that People can say whatever they want about Jesus, about Paul, about Christianity, but when you really dig between the lines, uh, they're elevated. Women who weren't allowed to be witnesses in courts of law, Jesus allowed them to be the first witnesses of his resurrection, a woman named Mary. So, I mean, you, you go through the gospels and you see women disciples contributing, supporting out of their private means. You see Paul lifting up women. And usually when you come to the pastorals and you see some restriction or some guideline about it. It usually has to do with something going on in that city or that culture where uh, the women, by their very nature, were almost taking over the spiritual uh, roles. And in 1 Timothy 2, Paul says, boy, I, I need men in every place to, to lift up holy hands in prayer and become leaders. Uh, so often those restrictions have to do more with what you'd call the silence of Adam, as Larry Crabb calls it, the, the man's tendency to, to go off and work over here and leave spiritual and relational things to women. But when you really dig between the lines, the New Testament of Christianity elevates women. And uh, even though some of them only got half of a verse, I don't think that's uh, too big of a deal. I think, I think they're happy to just be on the pages of Scripture. I, when, about 30 years ago, I was in Aberdeen doing doctoral work, and I got to write a couple of New Testament journal articles. and. About 20 years ago, somebody came to me and there was this translation of the Bible that came out, the NAT, NET Bible, and they said, Bob, you're in a footnote on page 1127 in the NAT Bible. And I went and looked, and I was like, in the Bible? And I thought, well, that's good enough for me. I can die. I'm in a footnote in some translation of the Bible. So I, I don't think these ladies mattered if they just got half of a line that said his mother or mine or whatever. I think they were just happy to, to be mentioned in the company of Paul. But I hope you're encouraged by the book of Romans. I hope you'll study it. I hope you'll master it. It's, it's a book about how the gospel comes into our lives and it begins to transform us from the inside out. The gospel embraced becomes the gospel embodied and it totally changes 
how we live. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book, is a prime example of all of that. We're going to close by singing one more worship song, Let the Redeemed of the Lord Say So. And that's who we are because of the gospel. We've been redeemed by Christ. We've been bought We've been, that, that Greek word means to buy back, to, to be redeemed, to be purchased for God's very own. We've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. We're gonna sing here in a moment, but let me pray. Lord, thank you for the message of Romans. Thank you for the truth that it enshrines. Thank you for how clear and simple it is. Thank you for how profound and deep it is. Thank you for the message concerning women. And I just pray today that the women in this church, the women watching online, any woman who's touched by the, by the voice and ministry of Oak Point Church would, would feel honored, would feel respected, would feel valued, would feel like a, a most valuable player in the work of the kingdom of God here on earth. And so I just commit our women to you, young and old. I pray for your blessing, your protection. Pray that they would feel your love and honor. I pray that the men around them, the sons, the husbands, the, the grandfathers, that they would just honor their women today as you do. Thank you, Jesus, for the transforming power of the good news, the gospel. Thank you that you came into the world to save sinners. We thank you in your name. Amen. Sing let the redeem. There's so
going to end with a little uh, numbers quiz. See if you can figure this one out. What do these numbers mean? 73, 74, 76, 51. It's not a combination to a, a safe. 73, 74, 76, 51. It's not chapters in the Bible. That's the temperature for the next four days. 73, 74, 76, 51, and then it's not coming back at all. It goes down from there. So the message is, the benediction is, go out and enjoy the next three days. God bless.